Hello, our names are Elmer and Joaquin, and we welcome you to another uh, interview by Room for Discussion at UVA Radio. Today, joining us via Zoom is Kenneth Roth, the executive director of the famous NGO Human Rights Watch. We'll be discussing the general trends around the consolidation of power within authoritarian regimes, and we will be focusing in on Hungary specifically. Recently, we have seen within Hungary, Viktor Orbán started ruling by decree, which has been regarded as a step towards an autocratic government. Moreover, we should explore how COVID-19 has allowed governments al around the entire world to tramp over human rights. Thank you, Kenneth Roth, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, well, we hope that you and your family are doing well during COVID-19. And then we just hope that, uh, and we know we can start talking about Human Rights Watch. So you, of course, are the executive director of Human Rights Watch. You joined the NGO for, you know, if you have been part of the NGO for a few decades now. But have you seen your role change as a result of COVID-19? Yes, I mean, the, the pandemic really poses both challenges and, and opportunities for Human Rights Watch and the human rights movement as a whole. Um, you know, the, the challenges are pretty straightforward. I mean, first of all, there's just the logistical challenge. Um, you know, we've been locked down like everybody else. Our offices are closed. We can't travel. And because so much of the work of Human Rights Watch involves, you know, going to the scene of the crime, conducting an on-the-ground investigation, you know, speaking to the witnesses and, and the abusers and, you know, putting together an objective account from the ground as to what occurred, it's harder to do that now. We can't physically get there. And so we have to use, you know, various forms of remote monitoring that we use in any event in places where it's too dangerous to go or where governments block us from arriving. Um, so, it, you know, some of it's not rocket science. It's just a matter of talking to people on the phone, emailing people, you know, getting, finding sources that way. Um, we also use, you know, more creative things um, like satellite imagery, we use um, open source investigations, you know, piecing together videos and photos that might be found on social media, corroborating them and, and using them to analyze the situation. So it's very possible still to do the work. It, it's more difficult. In terms of, you know, programmatically, the, um, the pandemic has in many ways exacerbated some tendencies we were already seeing. So with respect to say, you know, marginalized populations, many governments have simply reinforced a focus on what they perceive as their mainstream constituents. So we see like a further marginalization of people who are left behind. And that is you know, something we're very much fighting against because indeed the pandemic has shown us that you, know, you can't be safe by ignoring certain populations because the, the virus will flourish there and then spread. You know, the virus doesn't respect social barriers. Right. So we've done a lot of work there um, with respect to, you know, say the more autocratic response, we see governments using the pandemic as an opportunity to silence their critics, to undermine the and balances on their authorities, to, to render themselves even less accountable than they already were. And, you know, that um, is understandable from the government's perspective. It's a great opportunity for them. It's something we have to fight against. And we're doing that not simply by highlighting the human rights principles and standards that are flouted in the process, but also more pragmatically by showing that, you know, there's this um, argument out there that the strong man, the dictator can better deliver in a time of crisis. But in fact, what we see is that the autocrat foremost serves himself. He pursues his political interests rather than the public welfare. And so by showing that we actually are um, working to discredit this autocratic response. And so these are, you know, among the challenges, but frankly, also the opportunities presented by this pandemic when at a moment when, in a sense, everything is thrown up in the air, there are really new possibilities. This gives us a chance to reimagine how things like free speech or privacy or, or democratic government are observed, you know, even in time of crisis, which is when you particularly need them. But as a brief description uh, for the audience, you know, the NGO Human Rights Watch is broken into three mechanisms. So investigate, expose, and change. Which one would you say has the biggest impact on safeguarding human rights? Well, the, the three are completely connected. In other words, you have to start off with the facts. You know, Human Rights Watch has influence because we are known as a very reliable source of objective reporting, um, 
incisive analysis of what's going on. So, you know, step one, you need to be able to say, you know, what are the human rights violations that the government is committing? And we document them. We're often the definitive source for what is happening on the ground. Um, next, you have to um, expose them, publicize them, because, you know, in today's world, you know, even amidst the rise of autocrats, everybody pretends to respect human rights. It's become an essential element of governmental legitimacy. And so if we can show that that, you know, pretense of respect for human rights is violated in practice, it's embarrassing to governments. It stigmatizes them, it shames them. And they go to great lengths to avoid that. You know, at first, just by attacking us, by trying to discredit us, but ultimately when they realize that, you know, they're not gonna be able to get rid of the, the bad press without changing their bad conduct, that's when we begin to make progress. That's when we can sit down with them and say, look, these are the steps we need to take if, to improve your respect for human rights. And then finally, you know, we go to powerful governments who potentially are allies in putting pressure on an abusive government to change. And so here we work with, um, you know, a range of governments around the world. They tend to be, you know, more democratic, more rights respecting themselves, but they have in their foreign policy a commitment to promote human rights. And so we work with them and say, look, here's the problem. Would you use your clout on behalf of the human rights cause? You know, would you speak out about the problems? Will you condition, say, um, you know, economic assistance, military aid, invitations to prestigious summits? You know, whatever the target government wants, the idea is to make it more difficult for that government to get it until it improves its human rights practices. So in that sense, you know, the investigate, expose, change, no single element that stands by itself. You need those three working together to really push governments forward. And of course, with Human Rights Watch giving so much exposure to events in different, let's say, for instance, autocratic governments, yeah, you need the, a, the NGO needs some sort of legitimacy to come with it. But then why should we trust Human Rights Watch as opposed to, let's say, any other autocratic government like Orban the Victor's one? Yeah, I mean, this is where one's track record matters. You know, Human Rights Watch has been doing this for 40 years. We have a long track record of accurately, um, honestly, you know, with scrupulous attention to detail, reporting what happens. So you don't build credibility out of the blue. It's not something that just starts from scratch. You build it over time. At this stage, we are known for being, you know, not partisan. We don't get involved in political disputes. We don't take sides in elections. You know, we don't pursue other agendas. We are here just to promote human rights. And so we do that through accurate reporting. Now, obviously we're attacked all the time, but because we have the facts on our side, we win those public debates. So a government may say, oh, you misunderstood, or you were biased, or you were paid off, or you know the usual kind of arguments you get. Um, but people see through those very quickly because we just report the facts. We say, this is what happened. You know, Show us where we got it wrong. And they can't because we got it right. And in those situations, governments quickly find that their cheap public relations efforts don't work. You know, if they really want to um, stop us from reporting, they got to change what they're doing, no. you know, and we acknowledge the improvements. We're happy to do that. We're eager to do that. But in the meantime, if all we're getting is a bunch of human rights violations, that's what we're going to report. And their summary denials or their, you know, efforts to change the subject or their efforts to put forward disinformation, People see through that. We puncture those those myths that they try to um, that they try to promote. Yeah. So, on this kind of cheap uh, form of public relations, it, back in April, on your article that you wrote that we thought was uh, very interesting, Zoltan Kovacs, the Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Relations of Hungary, he said on your article that you arrive a couple of weeks late to the party, copying and pasting from all the other op eds written by Western critics. Uh, exactly the same charges we've read so many times before, and like the rest of them, offers nothing to back them up. So this is nothing new for you, right, this type of criticism. That kind of stuff is completely standard procedure. Yeah. And frankly, you know, that's the kind of, you know, emptiness that um, is classic for a, an autocrat who has nothing to say. Yeah. So, oh, you're just repeating what other people have said, and there are no facts, you know, even though we put all the facts in the article, and if they just go to our website, it's filled with the facts that, that yeah. describe we were summarizing the op-ed. So it's just, you know, that's kind of the empty rhetorical denial that nobody buys. Um, and it's, it's actually a sign of desperation. You know, when, when governments resort to that kind of cheap denial, you know that they're in trouble. You know that they've got nothing real to say. Um, and that's when they're, you know, they're feeling the heat, they're feeling the pressure. That's when we begin to get them to change. Yeah, but so the protocol on this as well. So 
I mean, if they say this, this is the uh, Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, if they say this against the executive director of a human rights watch organization, well, human rights organization, that's a pretty big deal, no? Like, you don't have protocol against that? Because we were pretty surprised when we read that. That was not standard for us. Read my Twitter feed, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, I get that kind of crap thrown at me all the time. You know, it's just, um, and, and it, it's, it's just, you know, it's a sign um, that governments are on the back foot. You know, when they have nothing to say, they resort to cheap rhetoric. You know, it's actually when we know we've, we've struck a nerve, when they suddenly the trolls and they start, you know, lambasting us with, you know, one piece of garbage after another. Yeah. And that's when we begin to make pro progress. Uh, that's a great piece of uh, <laughs> interview. Um, last April, in reference to Hungary, you wrote that, you know, this is the title of your article, or the main quote, 10 million EU citizens now live under authoritarian rule. But why is Hungary no longer considered a struggling democracy, but rather an established autocratic government? Um, no, the, the, the tendencies that we see in Hungary today are really the, um, the latest development in a long trend. And you know, since Viktor Orban has, has assumed, you know, the position of prime minister, he has systematically tried to undermine the checks and balances on his executive authority. And it's been a very deliberate long-term strategy. And so he has, you know, he already really by um, you know manipulating elections, he's been able to secure a controlling two-thirds stake in the parliament on behalf of Fidesz, his, his party. Um, but he then has used that to try to undermine, for example, the independence of the courts in you know, stacking them with, with political cronies. He has been slowly kind of gobbling up through various cronies the independent media so that there are fewer and fewer voices, particularly voices of significance, that can really speak an alternative um, to the, the propaganda that comes from, from government ministries. Um, he has been deliberately attacking civil society. Um, he has attacked academic freedom, going so far as to essentially expel Central European University, one of Europe's foremost academic institutions, forcing them to leave Budapest. So um, these are, you know, among the steps that he's been taking. What really prompted this warning call, this, this declaration on our part, that the European Union had ceased to be a club of democracies, and it was still a free trading club, but it purported to be a club of democracies, but it couldn't say that anymore when one of its members had become a dictatorship. And what prompted us to um, note that sad fact is that um, Orban used the coronavirus pandemic as a pretext to declare an emergency and to adopt the power to rule by decree, uh, meaning that he can rule simply by executive order without even the need to go to the parliament that he controls in any event. Um, and that was, you know, a, a big step toward dictatorship. He also, in essence, postponed elections indefinitely pending approval by, again, his parliament. So these were, you know, dramatic steps. And that's what led us to, to make that declaration. And now, you know, I suppose the good news is that there was quite a bit of outlaw. Um, there, was, there was pressure put on Orban. And he felt the need to backtrack. But Orban is very skilled at, you know, taking one step backwards, but actually two steps forward. You know, so he officially ended the emergency. He ended this, you know, immediate power to rule by decree. But then he just, you know, in his typical fashion, substituted another form of rule by decree and pushing through legislation that um, allows him at any point to declare a so-called medical emergency, something that would require recommendation by his, you know, kind of chief medical examiner, who's a political appointee, somebody he controls. And once he does that, he can, again, rule by decree, including, you know, shutting down protests, you know, which is what he really cares about, you know, for six months at a time, renewable, indefinitely. And, and we've seen how he renews these kinds of emergencies because he did something similar with migration. You know, following the 2015, um, you know, big incident of migration in Europe, um, he used that to declare an emergency, which keeps getting re you know, repeated every six months. And so we still have a migration crisis, I think the term is, 
Um, and now we have the possibility of an endless medical emergency. Yeah. It's just designed to give him the power of dictating, the power to rule without needing even the parliament that he controls. There's also a political sentiment change to it as well, because then everyone rails at him for the rule by decree that he's an authoritarian, and then he takes it back, and it's like, okay, I didn't really do anything. Look, I was just using it against Corona, and then he can rail against the opposition in parliament as well, right? So it's a bit of that sentiment too. Yeah, I mean, he, he definitely tries to use it in that sense. I, I think that um, he, I mean, first of all, the idea that he was just using it against the virus is I think transparently false. You know, for example, one of the things he did was use it to make it harder for transgender people to register yep. their preferred um, gender. And that, you know, th what does that have to do with the virus? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, being a dictator and pandering to his, you know, ultra conservative political base. So, um, and, you know, as for the European Union, I have to say, you know, and we can get into this in a bit more detail, but the European Union has really been spineless in standing up to Orban. Yeah. yeah. As you say, we will um, do get into that in a little bit on. But on the okay. EU, uh, you know, international human rights often do justify the declaration of a state of emergency. For instance, Article 15 in the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. And out of uh, the 47 countries that have ratified, ratified this convention, only six uh, used uh, this article to... Um, declared a state of emergency during COVID-19. So what would you say that this is are the consequences? Well, I think it's important to recognize that um, declaring an emergency does not give anybody carte blanche under international human rights law. It allows you to take steps that are necessary and proportionate in accordance with law to address a crisis. And so, I mean, to put this in a broader context, you know, many European governments, whether or not they declared an emergency, you know, imposed extraordinary measures to fight the pandemic. We had, you know, essentially, you know, quarantines, limitations on travel, um, enforced social distancing. You know, some countries say you have to wear a mask. This is all completely legitimate. Nobody quarrels with that. You know, it's all seen as, you know, necessary proportionate steps to address a serious health threat. Orban wants to take it further. You know, he could have just taken those steps like every other European government, but no, he had to use this as a chance to bolster his dictatorship. You know, nobody else said, I want to rule by decree. You know, nobody else starts, you know, pursuing a homophobic agenda. You know, nobody else is using this to kind of continue to undermine the checks and balances on his authority. And in the midst of all of this, he, he's, um, you know, he continues to attack NGOs. There's just the most recently, what the leading um, news site, um, online news site in Hungary, is being, you know, probably decimated through kind of a corporate structure where um, um, where Orban's cronies are now suddenly saying, "Oh, we don't need any independent reporting in Hungary. We can just use the wire services. You know, we'll we'll import news from abroad." You know, great. You know, it's a, a cost saving measure that coincidentally means there's no independent reporting on Orban's dictatorship. You know, so he does things like this that have nothing to do with the pandemic, and that's why. Um, it's not enough to say, oh, he's just following the, you know, the procedures in international human rights law that allow for extraordinary measures in extraordinary times. No, he's using that as a pretext to do far more. I think the best example of that is perhaps on the 12th of May, under the new bill, punishable offense regarding dissemination of fake news about the coronavirus. And this has been, you know, a widespread use by autocratic governments, which they claim that they, can, they have to you know, cut down on, on all fake news regarding COVID-19. And as a result, in Hungary, 64-year-old Andras was detained by police after just making a Facebook post, which was more of his opinion rather than fake news. And then the question would be, are you concerned of the large implications this has on individual freedom of expression? I, I mean, yes. And what happens, what is happening in Hungary is, you know, is in this respect is not radically different from what we're seeing in other autocratic states, you know, whether um, you know, Sisi's Egypt or Erdogan's Turkey or, you know, Modi's India. Um, what you find with many autocrats is that they want to restrict um, the dissemination of information about the spread of the virus and in particular about the government's response. Now, this is a disaster from a public health perspective. You know, it's wrong as a matter of human rights, but it's also dangerous because, you know, Public Health 101, the first rule of public health is you've got to have immediate access to accurate information in order to learn about 
viral and other threats and to prompt um, an official response and to enable the public to protect itself. Um, and so, you know, we saw what happens when this goes wrong. Look what the Chinese government did in Wuhan back in December. You know, for basically three weeks, they suppressed rather than heeded the warnings of the doctors in Wuhan who said, something's going on here. We have a SARS-like coronavirus that is causing pneumonia-like symptoms and killing people. Um, and the government's response was, shut up, you know, people discipline. Yeah. And during those three weeks, literally millions of people fled Wuhan or traveled through it, and the virus went global. So that just shows the disastrous consequences of blocking free access to information about public health threats. But of course, what governments are most concerned about is criticism of their response, because governments are worried about you know, anything that would reduce their popularity or undermine their legitimacy. And, and Viktor Orban's a perfect example. You know, there's this kind of theory out there that in time of crisis, you need a strong man, you need an autocrat, you need somebody to take charge, you know? And Viktor Orban, you know, loves that kind of rhetoric. But, you know, let's look at what he actually did. Now, you know, Orban had a history of ignoring public health. He receives these massive funds from the European Union and essentially uses them, you know, not to pay for, say, hospitals, where you literally have to bring your own toilet paper to a, yeah. a hospital for disaster. But he, but he uses them to build football stadiums, soccer stadiums, which tend to be built by his cronies, and it's a way yeah. of paying. So, you know, now what's he doing in the midst of the pandemic? Well, this strong man, this, you know, brilliant dictator, um, ordered all the hospitals to empty 60% of their beds to make room for coronavirus patients. That's a radical, because what it basically said is, I don't care if you have a heart condition. I don't care if you're a cancer patient. I don't care what happens to you, just get out of the hospital. And no provisions were made for care of people who were sent home or to the streets. And quite a few of them died. You know, but it's almost as if Orban said, oh, I don't care about you because you're not going to be a coronavirus statistic. I just care about my coronavirus statistics. He now doesn't even answer any questions. You know, so how many, you know, of those empty beds were even needed? You know, what happened to the people who were dumped on the street? Um, these are the kinds of things you get when you have an unaccountable government. And these would be, you know, probably the first things that his critics would talk about. But that's what this fake news, you know, meaning um, uncomfortable news, yeah. um, that law is designed to suppress. So, because I want to touch upon this kind of on a bird's eye perspective, because there's this big trope that there's this kind of tension between liberal democratic values and then the ability to respond to COVID-19. But if you look at China, the lack of civil liberties actually made the transparency, I would say, worse, right? The entire situation worse. Why does this myth, do you think, endure this kind of idea that democracies are not best able to handle these kind of situations when it seems like the opposite is actually true? Well, look, it, it, I think it's, you know, a couple of things. I mean, one, obviously democracy is messy. Um, you know, so I, there's this sense of, oh, well, the dictator can just order things done which is true, except that the, you know, what the dictator tends to order is first and foremost, things that protect his political interests. So, you know, why did the authorities in Wuhan suppress the whistleblowing doctors? Because, you know, the word from Beijing is no bad news, nothing that would tarnish the brilliant image of Xi Jinping. And that was the priority, not protecting the Chinese people. Um, and so ultimately they contained the virus, but at the cost of, you know, this pandemic and the rest of the world. So um, that's, you know, one example. Now, I, I think we have to acknowledge, though, that you know, just because you have a democracy doesn't mean you have a wise leader. So there are, you know, the Trumps of the world or Bolsonaro, um, you know, who just deny that the virus is a problem um, and, you know, are most concerned about keeping the economy going because they feel that that will bolster their, um, their electoral prospects. And, um, you know, we've seen that that hasn't worked well in the United States or in Brazil. Um, but at least you can say that in these countries that have flourishing democracies, there, you know, there's an independent court system that fights back. There are independent legislators or Congress people who, who fight back. There are civil society. There's a vigorous media. And these are ways to correct things. So, you know, even though, you know, the national government, the federal government um, in the United States or Brazil is, in, is, is pretty bad right now because of, you know, the Trump Bolsonaro leadership. Um, the states, you know, the federal system in these societies, many of them are fighting back effectively. And so, you know, that's why New York City, for example, New York State um, contained the virus. You know, it's really well on the way to recovery because 
you had in that case, you know, a, a governor who wasn't an autocrat, who you know wasn't playing Trump's game. And so there is this ability of democracies to um, to correct even a bad leader. But nonetheless, the, nonetheless, this myth is maintained, and that's why I think it's important to look at Orban. You know, how does a dictator operate? And he obviously is operating foremost in his political interests. You know, I mean, how can a, a dictator be serving the public welfare when he dumps 60% of hospital patients on the street? Yeah, but do you think there is kind of a general, I don't know, basic rule you can put on this, right? As you increase on the spectrum, because there are some papers that show that democracies are better at handling, for instance, non-communicable diseases. But when we, when we talk about something as global and as contagious as COVID-19, would you say it's a fair heuristic to say as you increase on levels of democracy, increase on your respect for human rights and civil liberties, then the adequate responses will follow. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, you can never state an absolute. I think you know, you if can. you had to bet on like, where where would you want to live? You know, do you want to live in a dictatorship or do you want to live in a democracy? You know, where do you think your, your welfare is going to be better served? Now, you know, every once in a while, there's a dictatorship that manages to sort of govern decently. You know, people always talk about the Lee Kuan Yew model in Singapore, you know, yeah. who for whatever reason, um, you know, even though he was a complete autocrat, um, he was able to build Singapore. And, um, but then, you know, for every Lee Kuan Yew, there is, you know, a, um, a Nicolas Maduro or a Robert Mugabe or a Victor Orban who is just out for himself and who leads the country to ruin. You know, if you look at the devastation of Venezuela, for example, which was, you know, one of Latin America's wealthiest countries. It's an oil-rich country, but because Maduro was more concerned with maintaining power than with serving the people, um, it's a basket case. It's now shedding refugees. It's, 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 you know, a disaster for the people who live there. And that happens very frequently when you've got autocrats. So if you just kind of take the average, if you, if you have to bet, you'd be out of your mind to bet on the dictator. And even in a place like China, where they like to say, oh, you know, look at GDP is growing, you know, six, 7% every year. What they really do everything to avoid is any analysis of what's happening to ordinary people. And um, that's because ordinary people are often just crushed in this process. Um, you get, you know, environmental devastation, you get corrupt local officials, you get land that seized, you get people who are just, you know, in prison. I mean, if you look at the, the Uyghur Muslims in, in Xinjiang, you know, one million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims locked up for so-called re-education, really meaning, you know, locked up until they drop Islam, until they abandon Islam. I mean, that's what an autocrat can do, you know, or building this highly intrusive surveillance state where you've got zero privacy and where your access to any governmental benefit depends on some governmental rating system of your um, political and social reliability. So, you know, it, it's... China loves to focus, the Chinese government loves to focus on this one measure of progress, GDP growth, you know, and they desperately avoid any analysis of how individual Chinese people are treated. Um, and that, frankly, is one of the roles of Human Rights Watch is to bring it back to the individual, because um, the aim of a country, a government, shouldn't be just to build GDP, it should be to improve the lives of the people. And, and you've got to be able to measure that. And so while, yes, you know, you know the average Chinese person is wealthier today, the average Chinese person also has, you know, no political freedom whatsoever. And very significant numbers of people have been devastated by this dictatorship, you know, beginning with the Muslims of Xinjiang. I think it's uh, very interesting and accurate, the comparison that you do between Venezuela and uh, Hungary in relation to perhaps Chavez and Nicolás Maduro and Viktor Orban uh, being very much self-interested and not for the population at large. In, you know, back in November 2019, the New York Times published a report that uh, stated that Victor Orban government has utilized subsidies coming from the common agricultural policies. These are the subsidies by the EU for agriculturists, European agriculturists, to install a patronage network. You have repeatedly said about his cronies, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, would you say that we can hold the EU responsible for enabling Orban's autocratic government? Yes, the EU has a big part of the responsibility here. And you know, to take a step backwards for a moment, the European Union is very good about um, setting standards of respect for democracy and human rights when it comes to aspiring members. There's a so-called Copenhagen criteria, which governments work and work and work to try to meet. Um, and it's a great incentive to pull governments up to a certain level of respect for human rights and democracy. The European Union is terrible 
at enforcing any kind of comparable standards once you're a member. And you know what's happening in Hungary and, and to a significant extent in Poland as well illustrates that problem. You know, once you're inside the tent, the European Union doesn't really exercise the tools that it has to ensure ongoing compliance. And let me, um, I mean, there, there really are three things that the European Union could be doing. Um, and it's worth kind of running through them because it just gives you a sense of, of you know, how, how tepid, how half-hearted the EU response has been. Um, you know, one, let's begin with not a formally the European Union, but a, a European institution, which is um, the European Parliament. The, um, the European Parliament is, is, has various political groupings or political alliances. And the largest one, in a sense, the ruling one, is um, the center-right political alliance known as the EPP, the European People's Party, of which Fidesz, Orban's party, is a member. Now, you have to ask, you know, why is the leading center-right alliance in the European Parliament embracing the party of the dictator? That's an embarrassing question to them. Um, Human Rights Watch pressed very hard on this about a year ago and was able finally, with the help of others, to um, force, persuade the EPP to suspend Fidesz. So currently Fidesz is suspended. Once you know Fidesz was party to the Orban dictatorship, though, we said that things are worse. It's time to expel Fidesz. Um, but the EPP is, you know, worried about, oh, they'll lose Fidesz's votes. And you know, what if they push them to a far right party? And, you know, it's, I mean, all these narrow political considerations that basically say, yes, we're going to continue our complicity with this dictatorship because other things matter more to us. It's an utterly shameful response. And, you know, the parties, the, the constituent parties of the EPP that have been the worst in this respect have actually been Germany's CDU, CSU, you know, ruling um, party, um, as well as the Republicain of France, you know, Sarkozy's party, old party. Um, and so these are not just like minor little abstract nothing parties. These are big mainstream parties that are still can't say Fidesz is beyond the pale, we're going to expel them. So that's, that's one thing. Um, you know, second, there has been some pressure that has come from um, the European Court, for example, um, which just recently ruled against Orban's effort to kind of impose a Putin-like rule that tars any civic group, any non-governmental group that receives funding from abroad. Um, in Putin, they, you know, they say that you're a foreign agent, which effectively in Russian means you're a spy. And Orban tried to institute something similar in Hungary. The court just struck that down. Um, they similarly struck down an effort he um, had to just kind of hold asylum seekers in um, horrible conditions yeah. along the Although again, in typical Orban fashion, he complied with that ruling, but then made things worse by then saying, okay, you know, we won't let asylum seekers apply on the border. They'll have to apply in an embassy someplace else, which is completely undermines the point of asylum because the point of asylum is you show up at the border. You know, if your refugee status is what you get from another place, asylum is what you get at the border. So we basically ripped up the law of asylum. So these are, you know, examples where European institutions have played a helpful but half-hearted role. You know, similarly, the um, the European Commission has invoked so-called Article Seven, which is what you can do to um, impose um, sanctions, ultimately loss of voting rights. On that is not respecting democratic standards. But it's unanimity based. It's that's the problem with that's the problem with Article Seven, right? So it's unanimity based. The vote it's and unanimity. Poland. But there's still they could push it forward. In other words, yes. I mean, in other words, Hungary or Poland could cover for the other. Yeah. But there hasn't been a serious effort to push. Now, the the last thing I want to mention here, which is I think the the lever that is the most powerful, is the budgetary lever. We just finished talking about how the European Union, through these stabilization funds, has been, um, in, in a sense, subsidizing European, Europe's dictatorship. You know, they've been paying for Orban to buy off his cronies and to entrench his dictatorship. And the the good news is that um, the current European Union seven-year budget is coming to an end this calendar year. Um, a new budget has to be adopted for beginning January first. 
And fortuitously, <clears throat> Germany is going to be in the presidency of the European Union during these last six months of 2020. So Germany is going to be in the driver's seat, both because it holds the presidency and because it is the larger donor to the European Union's budget. And I've personally spoken with Angela Merkel. Um, she is determined not to continue this shameful subsidizing of Orban's dictatorship, this, this pay a, payment yeah. of a choice within Europe's democracy. Now, that's also going to be a little tricky because um, theoretically, the budget is done unanimous, unanimously, you know, and so Orban could try to veto that. But there's a parallel effort to use legislation, which requires a, a supermajority, but a, a, an obtainable supermajority, to impose those conditions on the budget separate from the budget. And so there's kind of clever, you know, Brussels type maneuvering to get around the European Union's unanimity requirement for the budget. But this budgetary lever is really what's going to talk. And if Merkel and those who believe in democracy with her succeed in really conditioning aid to Orban, that could be a huge influence in forcing him to back off some of his dictatorial plans. Like, I, I mean, as a, as a young person, I don't understand how anyone can really be optimistic or, like, you know, proud of the EU in this consideration, because there's a far stretch to say that the EU is just actually failing to protect individual human rights in the case of Hungary. Just the lack of the EPP kicking out Orban's party, as you said, the Article 7. I mean, Poland, I think we can assume that Poland is going to strike with Hungary if that were to ever happen. And the slowness, I think the actual infringement proceedings are just very long uh, and they'd be take too much time to actually do it for the rule of decree. Like, I don't understand how, like, for me, I just seem that that carries a lot of skepticism for the European Union in the sense that it is so unable to act in a fast way. Even when you just said that the budget will be somehow possible to take some of the dictatorial powers of Orban. You can't even do full stretch and say, you know, completely shut down on Orban's consolidation of power. Like, do you understand why this is just a really concerning and quite upsetting situation for the EU? I completely understand. Um, and I, I said the, um, you know, the European Union is really not used to dealing with challenges to democracy from within its borders. Um, and Orban is really the first manifestation of this. There was always this assumption that, you know, once you're in the club, you stay a strong democracy. You know, you look like France or Netherlands or whatever. Um, but we've seen that that's not the case, that there can be backsliding. And I think a real weakness in the European Union currently is its um, slowness in addressing that internal threat. And it's not just Hungary because everybody's watching Hungary to see if it gets away with stuff, can others? And so you see, you know, the Polish government, um, peace, the, the ruling party there, you know, very deliberately pushing their effort to undermine the independence of the judiciary there. Um, you see, you know, autocrats in in Serbia, in, in um, you know, in various places, particularly in, you know, in, in East Central Europe, watching Orban very closely. And so the stakes here are enormous. And the European Union has to decide, is it going to just go back to being a trade club? You know, fine, we can have free trade, free travel. Is that all it is? Or is it going to be, you know, something that really stands for democracy? And this, you know, frankly, is also a crisis that's coming up in terms of European Union foreign policy. Because we've been talking here about how Orban treats his own people. But Orban um, is also, has been a disaster for European Union foreign policy, where he really tries to um, block any strong initiative on behalf of human rights you know, often doing the dirty work of, of Putin or of Xi Jinping. And, you know, most recently this happened, um, I think many, many people know that Trump has attacked the International Criminal Court. He's taken the extraordinary effort to impose sanctions on the ICC staff because it had the audacity to investigate um, potential war crimes by Americans in Afghanistan and by Israelis in Palestinian territory. Um, so this is a kind of a blatant effort to undermine the rule of law, to secure impunity for American and Israeli war criminals. And the European Union, to its credit, said, this is outrageous. You know, We all belong to the ICC. We can't allow this to stand. Um, and they put together a very strong statement. And at the last minute, Hungary tried to block it. Now, um, you know, Joseph Burrell, the, um, essentially the European Union's foreign minister, the leader of external affairs, he, um, 
has been saying for some time that you cannot run foreign policy around a system of unanimity. You can't allow you know, a single autocrat to block the whole European Union. And so in this case, they basically put the statement out anyhow. Um, you know, 26 of the 27 governments signed on. I don't think anybody even noticed that Hungary didn't. It looked the same, but it showed how the European Union is beginning to move, um, you know, past some of the, the, the requirements that really have hamstrung a tougher response, in that case around foreign policy, but they're going to need to do similar things around internal policy. You know, you can't allow Poland to block pressure on Hungary because it just takes two autocrats to completely undermine um, the effort to uphold democracy uh, within the European Union. Uh, you mentioned this before about the EPP, which is that, you know, at a certain uh, case, even Donald Tusk is recommending that it should be reconsidered that Fidesz is actually kicked out. And that seems good in practice, right? Fidesz is taken out of the EPP, but I mean, it's suspended right now. But isn't that a further motivating reason for the consolidation power of Orban? Because then he can, I guess, further motivate anger against the European Union as being this kind of totalitarian uh, institution that threatens Hungary's autonomy. I mean, I'm sure he'll try to use it that way. But when, when, when you look, I mean, currently the EPP is giving Orban legitimacy. You know, the effect of Fidesz still being part of the EPP, even though they're, you know, they're suspended, but they're still a full-fledged member, you know, it allows Orban to say, I'm a legitimate guy. You know, I'm, I'm a recognized part of the leading political alliance in the European Parliament. You know, what are you complaining about? What's about a dictatorship? I'm part of the EPP. You know, and so I think we're, we have to recognize the enormous legitimizing effect of EPP membership. And it's time to bring that to an end. But then you know, the question is, why has the you know, EU become so hesitant in clamping down uh, Orban, Orban's uh, government? Well, I mean, part of it is in terms of the EPP, it is, you know, it, it has to do with politics within the European Union. Um, it's the, you know, the center right that is less powerful than it was. It sees itself challenged, you know, not only by the center left, but also by, you know, by Macron, by the Greens, by, you know, various forces that are newer. And it is playing defense and it doesn't want to lose this group of votes that Fidesz, you know, Orban's party represents. So it's just, you know, narrow politics above democratic principle. It's as simple as that. Do you think this you know? is why Ursula von der Leyen is so hesitant to actually be direct against Hungary? Because, for instance, she made a statement, EU Observer, a couple of weeks ago where it's like, yeah, we should make sure people aren't, you know, violating human rights through corona crisis. But she didn't even mention Hungary explicitly. Like... Do you think these kind of previous biases and political linkages is actually kind of scaring some really high political leaders in the EU kind of into submission? Um, well, I mean, yes, it's if you look at the statement that the European Union put out when when Orban first um, adopted this you know, emergency power to rule by decree, it was so anodyne, it was so yeah. vague yeah. that, that Orban joined it. You know, making an utter mockery of the criticism. You know, it, it was such a vague statement of principles. He's signing on to that too. He's not criticizing me. You know, and it, so it just showed the emptiness of this inability to really pressure Orban. Um, and it, it's a typical thing. You know, just broad statements of principle. Nobody feels the heat from those. You got to name the perpetrator. Yeah. Okay. So let me just quickly transition because. When we talk about the European Union, I think this is, again, these platitudes that the European Union promotes. I mean, you can read a bunch of their policy papers and it's not too simple, but it's like, you know, we need more oversight. We need constitutional limits. Uh, we need to strengthen the EU's leadership in promoting and protecting human rights and democracy. But they sound like great platitudes that don't actually really do anything. Right. Do you think that's a fair analysis to make? Because I still don't feel like much is going to be done, even if this budget oversight is going to happen. Is there could an average EU citizen kind of lose faith in the European Union's ability to handle this? Uh, would you say that's a fair analysis to make? Well, I mean, I, I, so far, yes, there's reason to lose faith because there's been very little done to rein Orban in. Um, it's, you know, it's one thing to state broad principles, it's another to apply them. And yeah. so, um, you know, the challenge now is how do you take the theoretical commitment to democratic principles, to checks and balances on executive authority, to respect for human rights, limiting governments, um, how do you turn that into a reality in Hungary? And so, you know, even if the European Union's budget is adopted, um, it's not going to say, you know, no money to Hungary. 
to say, you know, these are the principles, you know, governments that undermine the rule of law, that don't respect democratic principles, you know, that they are not entitled to these EU subsidies. And then you're going to have to apply those. So it's it's going to be, you know, a two or multi-step process. Um, but the step one is to get those that conditionality entrenched in European Union legislation. Um, and I um, that's not going to be easy, but that's an essential first step before that conditionality can be used to in turn pressure Orban. As previously mentioned, um, Viktor Orban's government used the rule of decree to pass many legislations which had nothing to do in relation to COVID-19. So, for instance, Hungary's parliament recently voted to revoke the legal rights of transgender people to legally change their gender. Similarly, the Polish, the Polish LGBTQ community has uh, come under severe attack from their own government after the establishment of LGBTQ free zones. Now, You know, I went to the Human Rights Watch website and I have already read that you have reported on uh, on this issue, which means that you have done your first two mechanisms. But now what? I still fail to see what's the connection between Human Rights Watch reporting and how we actually produce change. Well, I mean, the let's talk about the homophobia, for example, because I, I do think that that is, um, it's a classic strategy of autocrats. Um, and you see the same thing with Putin. I mean, you see many governments Um, that are appealing to a socially conservative base. You know, they often have lost the cities. You know, Putin has lost Moscow and St. Petersburg, yeah. lost Budapest and another dozen or so um, leading cities around the country. So they they see their political base as the countryside, um, a more conservative set of constituents, and homophobia works great there, anti-Semitism works great there, xenophobia works great. You know, so these are the the themes that autocrats tend to pronounce when they are in a position like Orban. Um, and so it is, um, I mean, it's very much tied up with what we've been discussing. Um, it's, it's, it was notable that, um, you know, Polish President Duda, who has been very actively campaigning against gays um, in, in the current electoral campaign, he was the first person whom Trump invited to the White House since the pandemic broke. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, autocrats hang together, you know, but it, it was a real statement. You know, it was also notable, um, you know, Trump also invited um, Kosovo's president who was just indicted for crimes against humanity. You know, yeah. so, you know, values don't matter here, human rights don't matter, it's just autocrats sticking up for each other. But coming back to your question, you know, how do you put pressure on a government? It's not enough to just document the abuses, it's not enough to just publicize them. You do have to put pressure on them. And you know, our strategy really with Hungary has been the, the three elements that we've been discussing. It's you know, getting Fidesz expelled from the EPP. It's been using European institutions, whether it's the court or the commission, to, to squeeze Hungary, to invoke the various sanctions or legal rulings that they can use. And finally, it's using the European Union member states to put economic pressure on Orban by ceasing their subsidy of his autocracy. And so that's the plan, you know, that's the strategy. Now, um, you know, will it work? I don't know, you, we, you know, we, we, we see half step backwards, you know, periodically. He does feel the heat. He's very clever at pretending to give in and then continuing along the same lines as what he did before. And so the real test is going to be for European Union leaders not to be blinded by these half measures and to recognize them for what they are. And our job at Human Rights Watch is to keep the heat on the European Union members as well, to say it's not enough that Orban got rid of this particular emergency when he just gave him the power to rule by emergency, you know, whenever he wants. Um, and so you got to keep your eye on the ball. You got to look behind the superficiality and look at what's really going on. Um, there are lots of understandable reasons why European Union members don't want to do that. They have other concerns. They don't want to be in bad terms with Orban. But the stakes here are enormous. The stakes here are democracy in Europe. You know, the European Union as a club of democracies. And so that's why um, we're going to keep at it. And we clearly have certain very powerful European Union leaders with us on this. Um, so we'll see how this next six months unfolds. But I really think that these budgetary negotiations are going to be absolutely key to putting real pressure on Orban or not. Would you, send them then, would you say that then essentially comes down to the Human Rights Watch using its track record and legitimacy to set up meetings and communicate with European leaders to sort of like kind of lobby for human rights then? Well, yes. In other words, you know, step one is for us to document what's happening. 
Yeah. And the Human Rights Watch researcher who covers Hungary is, um, you know, regularly reporting on what's going on. You need that factual basis first. Um, we then, you know, publicize it, and we are good at getting uh, media attention. We get basically, you know, roughly a thousand media citations every single day for the work of Human Rights Watch. We have 11 million followers on social media between Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So we're good at getting the word out, um, at, at exposing and spotlighting the abuses. But then you got to invoke governmental pressure as well. And here um, we meet with government officials, we speak to them on the phone, we email with them, um, but we also use the same kind of media attention to them. So when the EPP was you know, reluctant to expel Fidesz, we did a big media campaign around the EPP. Yeah. You know, we're doing similar things now to try to get them to expel Fidesz. Um, we'll be doing similar things as the budgetary negotiations rev up insofar as there's resistance to imposing serious conditionality on the subsidization of Orban. So um, it's, you know, it's a combination of the tools. It's, it's in-person visits, but it's also regularly using the media because every governmental official cares about their public reputation. Now, according to a Freedom House report uh, published this year, countries in Europe and Eurasia have experienced a decade of democratic deficits, even at weighing net gains. Is the conclusion then that there is little room for optimism if we have to rely on NGOs in order to maintain democracy? Well, I, I should say that, you know, you don't rely on NGOs. NGOs are part of um, part of the political competition here. You know, our job is to, um, you know, we, we the privilege we have in a sense is we have resources, you know, people who contribute to us because they believe in human rights. That enables us to devote The, the human time and attention to gathering this information, to disseminating it, and to deploying it in a way that generates pressure. So NGOs are a big part of this, but we need governmental leaders to um, act upon their theoretical commitment to human rights and democratic values. We need the public to care about this. If the public says, oh, you know, democracy, whatever, we'll, we'll give up on that, you know, then um, you're going to lose democracy, you know. And so um, it's, it's, there's no single actor here. Um, everybody has their role. But I think the role of NGOs is um, as a repository of expertise, of investigative capacity, um, of reputation, and of the ability to then spread this information through the media to generate pressure for change. Yeah, so I think there's two parts in this, and I think this is also what Joaquin is hinting at, which is at the same time you need an organization like Human Rights Watch to produce the information for democratic citizens to make their own decisions. But there's also the concern that maybe Human Rights Watch, it's a sign of how much you're involved, the fact that you actually have to put pressures on European leaders as well, that there might be something lacking in how everything could operate in practice. Like, for instance, the fact that, let's say what you're doing right now with the pressure that you're putting on European leaders, is that something you think Human Rights Watch should be doing, like regularly, if that's, I guess, the right way to put it? Or is that a sign that something incorrect is happening? This is something we do all the time. I mean, to yeah. a slightly different context, you know, at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, Um, you know, there are governments that assemble there and they, um, many of them would be happy to just kind of vote on whatever's put before them, you know, and if you're going to get them to really take the initiative, you know, to sponsor a resolution on this or that country or this or that issue, um, you often have to encourage them. It doesn't happen on its own, you know, and it's, it requires coming to them and saying, look, if this is the factual situation on the ground, this is how we think you can make a difference. Um, would you lead on this? We think we have the following governments with you as allies. We then have to lobby and bring in you know, other governments to, to vote with them. But it takes, um, it takes a certain initiative, which governments being busy and having lots of different concerns don't necessarily take. You know? and, and so I, I don't think we should be surprised by that. That's just reality. You know, governments, they're worried about economics, they're worried about their political faith, they're worried about you know, a range of issues. Um, human rights is just one of them. And our job at Human Rights Watch is to raise the importance of human rights on governmental agendas. And often it is a matter of providing them the information. I mean, you, you think, oh, governments know everything, but in fact, governments don't, you know, and, and even, you know, though governments have embassies in countries, they often are much less informed than the Human Rights Watch researcher because they're, you know, their travel restrictions and security restrictions and um, they have other things to do. And so th there are very few governments that have that depth of information. So we're a resource first saying, here's the problem. 
Um, we often are also the strategists saying, this is how we think you can make a difference, but we need your help. You know, Human Rights Watch can't introduce a resolution at the UN Human Rights Council. We're a, you know, an NGO observer, we're not a government. So we need government to, to, to work. So we play a very important behind the scenes role. Same thing with the European Union. You know, the European Union has lots of concerns. Um, the enforcement of democracy within its borders isn't necessarily gonna be at the top without a certain degree of pressure. And here, civil society within Europe, the role of the media, um, the role of the public in saying democracy is important. We don't want to just become a trading club. We want to stay a club of democracies. That's required in order to push European Union officials to really act on their stated commitment to democracy and human rights. However, Western democracies are facing alienation from the from their elector, electoral base if they focus on foreign policy, given all the you know issues at the domestic level. Then our final question for you is, what will the future look like with an action against authoritarian consolidation of power? Yeah, well, it's, I think the, the foreign policy um, terrain had shifted um, foremost really for two factors. You know, one has been the withdrawal of the United States because um, under Trump, you know, this is the guy who loves to embrace dictators. He's not pushing against them with the occasional exception of a a Nicolas Maduro or, you know, somebody who happens to, to turn on him. Um, but, you know, usually he's perfectly happy to embrace the autocrats of the world. So the U.S. has really stopped being a credible principal force for human rights. The other factor is that the Chinese government in recent years has become much more assertive in international affairs, really to deliberately undermine the global system for the defense of human rights. Because it is terrified of its own repression being spotlighted. You know, Xi Jinping is increasingly insecure at home. That's why you see such an intense crackdown. You know, he, for example, you know, is terrified of Hong Kong because Hong Kong shows that Chinese people, when given the opportunity to speak, the last thing they want is ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. They want democracy. Um, he can't stand that, so he's now cracking down on Hong Kong. And at the global level, he's saying, I've got to stymie any international effort to defend human rights, even in places like Syria, because it might come back to haunt me. It might set a precedent that would boomerang. And so um, those two factors, an increasingly assertive China, a withdrawn United States, have shifted the train for the defense of human rights. Um, you could say that that would be a disaster, but it's actually been interesting. Um, what we've seen instead is that other governments, recognizing that there is no US leadership here, have stepped up to the plate. And so, you know, for example, in Venezuela, It's been a group of Latin American democracies plus Canada using the name of the Lima group that have been at the forefront of getting the UN Human Rights Council to denounce Maduro, sending Venezuela to the International Criminal Court, you know, really isolating Maduro politically. Um, when it comes to sort of the treatment of the Rohingya Muslims who were ethnically cleansed out of Myanmar, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, you know, hardly a friend of human rights normally, played a very frontline role in defending there. And similarly, you know, European governments have been at the forefront of pressing um, for the defense of human rights in Yemen, for standing up for Saudi repression, for you know, addressing a series of situations around the world, um, including um, China's repression in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. So um, Human Rights Watch is working very actively to build these new alliances for the defense of democracy and human rights. Um, it, is, it is a new playing field. But it's not a moment of despair. It's just a moment where we need new strategies and we need more governments and people to recognize that you can't just leave leadership on human rights to the United States. You know, in time of Trump, that's a good strategy and other people have to step forward. Mr. Roth, thank you for, uh, for that last question. It was a, it was a real pleasure. Uh, we appreciate you coming today. Thanks you so much for this conversation. I've enjoyed it.